I know. Oh, nuts. Okay. I nominate Meredith. Yeah. Nuts. All right. Cool. I, I um, can't flip you for it again. <laughs> So anyway, uh, welcome everyone to the panel on the copyright bills, uh, which is a combination of JCPA, Shop Safe, and Smart Copyright Act, which are acronyms we may or may not explain in the course of this uh, panel. Um, so I will be asking some questions to folks, and I think this will probably be a relatively free-flowing discussion, um, but want to leave some time at the end to make sure people have the chance to ask questions. Um, so we'll start off with introductions. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. I am the senior policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a Washington DC based consumer advocacy group. We work on a range of tech issues, uh, everything from net neutrality to privacy, to antitrust and competition, uh, to copyright and intellectual property laws, which is where I come in. Hi there, uh, my name is Corinne McSherry and I'm the legal director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we are a digital rights advocacy group. We do a combination of litigation, lobbying, um, advocacy, grassroots advocacy, and also we develop tools to help people protect their own privacy and security and um, we train people in how to use them. Um, and we work on a whole lot of, if it involves digital rights, we're there in one capacity or another. Um, my specialty, I do a lot of things these days because I run the legal team, but I specialize in um, copyright and trademark litigation. So that's me. I am not part of an advocacy group. I am an IP attorney practicing in Atlanta. I do mostly copyright and trademark work. I also teach at Emory teaching copyrights and trademarks and other IP. Um, I'm a transactional lawyer, which is to say my job is to avoid the fight rather than win it after we're in the middle of it. So I do, I spend more time drafting contracts than I do actually picking fights and litigating over things. My goal would be to put the litigators out of business by having such perfect contracts everywhere. Um, no, none of them are remotely worried, so. Uh. Hi, I'm not an attorney. Uh. I am Jim Nettles. I do a bunch of different stuff. I write a bunch of stuff in the fiction world. I write a lot of stuff in the nonfiction world, a lot of uh, IP data security sort of stuff. Um, my Much of my day life is in business and technology consulting work. I do a lot of work with creating IP. I work with a lot of IP creators. Um, I am currently doing a lot of work and have for a long time in a lot of the generative AI space. I really have not talked about it much over the years because nobody cared. Um, no, certainly and, they do. And now all of a sudden they do. Um, I am partnered into a lot of different companies, but I deal with a lot of IP creation. I deal with a lot of attorneys, and I do a lot of consulting around creation, securing, and monetizing IP. Hi, uh, I'm Dave Hansen, executive director of a nonprofit called the Authors Alliance. Uh, we support authors who want to see their works widely read uh, and who support access to knowledge and free inquiry. Um, we mostly focus on uh, copyright, intellectual property, and uh, sort of information policy law. Um, we, we are almost 10 years old. Uh, we were founded in 2014 um, and have, it's about 2,500 members. Membership is free, uh, so if you're interested, you can check us out. Awesome. So I think for the uh, sake of simplicity, because there's really sort of three major bills that were uh, on the billing, so to speak, uh, for this, I think we will move down them in order. Uh, so the first one, I'm actually going to kick down to Dave here, uh, as he, in his emails, foolishly volunteered to talk about it. Uh, the JCPA, the Journalism Competition Preservation Act, I believe. Dave, can you tell us what the JCPA is? Sure, you get, you got it. Uh, Journalism Competition and Preserva uh, Preservation Act um, is uh, the bill drafters swear up and down, not a copyright bill. Um, and in fact, if you look in it, uh, it has a provision that says that it doesn't affect copyright at all, which um, is interesting given the way that it's set up. Uh, so the, the basics for this bill is, um, I think, coming from a pretty good place. It's, it's uh, supposed to be addressing an issue of journalism really facing a crisis all across the U.S. Uh, you know, you see newsrooms closing, um, small broadcasters closing, and so there's a lot of impetus in Congress to do something about that. Uh, it's just that, um, so th I guess I'll be, try to be a little neutral here. You might get a sense that I don't like this bill. Um, but uh, so, so JCPA um, basically is designed to 
deal with this issue. And the way it goes about that is by saying, well, hey, these organizations um, are not generating the kind of revenue that they need. But if we look around, particularly looking around online, we see a lot of platforms that are linking to news content and making a lot of money off of it. Very large platforms, Facebook, uh, Google, um, and others. And so uh, this bill is designed to, it's, it's sort of the congressional version of uh, taking two kids and sticking them in the room and saying, don't come out until you've solved your problems. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, it's a um, bill that's designed to um, foster negotiation between those two industries um, so that uh, more money will flow to um, the uh, digital journalism outlets. Great. Did you have, James, do you want to jump in? So the, the comment I would make is from the perspective of having worked in media and journalism and being an IP creator, right? Um, and I've done it both in digital platforms, I've done it in print, I've done it in a lot of these different places. This is a big problem both for media outlets as well as for authors. Uh, because again, the writers and the creators in this space already don't get paid a whole lot. Um, it's already very problematic and as we look at technologies much as we were just talking about the generative stuff in the prior panel with generative technologies replacing so much more with media which means we're now creating the echo chambers and all the stuff and I won't repeat all of that again but as a creator we already have enough problems getting paid for work and getting accreditation to work and so there is a very hard line also having worked in a lot of these social platform areas between what is sharing things out to get traction you know, and notice for work, and at what point is everybody profiting except for the creator and the house or the content. <coughs> Great, um, does anyone want to add something on JCPA? I figure we can just sort of do them one at a time with the, with the reservation that I may cut off uh, and move to the next bill. I know this is probably the most controversial out of the bunch, so I do want to make sure it gets plenty of so are we doing an overview of each and then coming back, or are we going to do this one to death and then move on? Let's do this one to death first. <laughs> so one thing I would say is that there's also a, um, there's a parallel uh, bill in the state of California um, that is on hold right now and uh, I think is likely to die. But it may not. And it is a, a funny thing where we've got a very similar bills, um, not copyright, but both addressing copyright in the federal government and the states. Um, and I think we'll see that replicated. And, and I think that, you know, part of the issue, and, and there's also similar provisions that have been proposed in other countries around the world, and the impetus behind it is pretty clear. Um, there's a strong sense that we need strong journalism to, uh, strong local journalism, strong national journalism. In this political environment, people need good and reliable information, and it can be really hard to get that when there's no good, you know, reporters can't get paid to actually do the work. Um, mm -hmm. One thing, though, that some um, journalists have pointed out is that the problem isn't just the rise of Google and Craigslist. The problem is also decades of consolidation in, um, in the news area and buying up of um, newspapers and other publications and magazines by private equity firms who aren't really particularly dedicated to the journalistic mission and are much more dedicated to just making as much profit as possible. So journalists, unfortunately, and reporters were getting fired and newsrooms were getting shut down long before the rise of big tech. Yes. Um, but, you know, so we have a situation where the news, the, um, the, the journalism was already in very significant straits uh, and was not well positioned to be able to come back you know, and survive and weather the storm and come to the other side because they were already, you know, kind of decimated and because the people behind it weren't the right kind of people um, committed to the mission that you might have seen, you know, 50 years ago. So it's, the problem is it's sort of trying to kind of solve one thing uh, from our perspective. Um, it's, it's a part of the solution, but it's not actually getting to the more fundamental problems, which are competition problems, which are antitrust problems. Um, and, you know, just a link tax isn't going to get you where you need to be in terms of addressing those fundamental problems. Um, and the other problem from my perspective is that this is likely to be a windfall for those very enormous media conglomerates. Um, it is not clear who's going to be in the room 
doing the negotiation. Is it going to be your local independent newspaper, assuming you're lucky enough to have one? Probably not. So this is going to make sort of the biggest uh, media conglomerates richer, as opposed to you know what it is designed to do, which is find a way to fund local journalism, which everybody wants and everybody needs. But the, we have a problem. Is this the right solution? Probably not. And I think that's the question that very seldom gets asked in Congress. I mean, I, when I first started looking into this bill, I'm like, wait, Klobuchar and Kennedy? <laughs> and that just seemed so unlikely. I'm like, well, that means this is either a really good idea or not. But one of the questions is not, I think that everyone will agree that the market such as it is in media is changing substantially, but I think that you're exactly right. I mean, most of you all are at least aware in Atlanta we have the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Well, it used to be the Atlanta Journal and the Atlanta Constitution. That was 20 years ago or so. Pre-big media, pre-big tech, the newspapers f failed. Now, are newspapers even viable anymore? I still get my paper copy of the Wall Street Journal, damn it. Me and three other dinosaurs still like it on paper. But if you see that journalism is going through a huge change and it does not seem to be going well for the journalists, yes, that is a problem to the extent that we need journalism. And I personally mm -hmm. think we do, but is an antitrust exemption and strangely worded um, text in this bill the right answer? And I seldom think that, huh, the market doesn't seem to be doing well. I'm the government. I'll fix that and do it better is not usually, in my mind, a good first step. So I start out skeptical whenever they say, oh, well, since the market isn't working, the government will do it better. Uh, sometimes things have to change. In this case, I mean, I think journalism is important. I'm not going to argue on that at all. But how mm -hmm. do you help support local journalists? All the AI in the world can't, well, actually will perfectly happily write news with no reporters on the ground telling, you know, actually reporting on what's happening and finding out what the facts are. We have already learned that AI will write news stories anyway, but is that okay? Is that what we want? But what can government do to fix it? Well, so, oh, the one comment I was going to make is I always have concerns when government wants to step into media. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's I'm from the government, I'm here to help, tell you, write, have you write a better story, then the first thing I go to is looking at the talking points that come out on on the lists and everything else, which is the first problem. I mean, when I started in, was doing local media B-roll kind of stuff in the <laughs> times, yeah. um, you know, and we, we brought everything out on papyrus, um, looking at the things that we would have to do to actually go somewhere and find out what the hell was happening Hmm. and cover it and provide facts, details, and enough local influence on how the story was told so that it reflected those readers, it, you don't see that at all anymore. So there's kind of two impulses that I think, well, there's three impulses that I think are sort of important to understand the JCPA, where it's coming from, and sort of its ultimate fate. One is this... Um, the response among medias to the growth of big tech has very often been, we need to ourselves be bigger in order to negotiate against big tech. Mm -hmm. That'll fix the problem. Negotiate against is in scare quotes uh, very often. So if you followed, um, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but the, the attempted Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster merger, um, those two, there are five major publishing houses uh, right now, I believe it's five and they were going down to four, yeah. um, or they were attempting to go down to four. Um, and the Department of Justice sued and actually got it blocked in for a lot of kind of remarkable thing. If you're a lawyer, there's a lot of minutia in there about why that's interesting. Uh, but one of the things that came out was that the merging publishers were telling the government, oh, we need to be able to do this so that we can negotiate against Amazon because Amazon is eating all of our lunch. And so we need to be bigger so we can stand up to them. But if you looked at the actual emails that came out in Discovery, the executives were saying, <laughs> emailing Amazon saying, we look forward to being a better partner to you as we move forward in this. So, you know, I think the impulse is, well, tech is big, we got to get bigger. Um, and that's part of the impetus behind this idea of like, well, we'll all get together and we'll all be a big journalism and we'll be able to fight on equal footing. Um, 
the other thing is that versions of this this particular framework have been tried elsewhere in the world. Um, yeah. And this is just kind of to, to build on what Dave was saying. Canada is sort of the most recent example of this. Now, if you follow the news, you know there's a lot of wildfires in Canada right now. Um, there is a Canadian news law which basically takes this framework that says, dear big social media platforms, you must negotiate with these, uh, you know, the major news sources in Canada and pay them some amount of money structured in a certain way in order to be able to link to their news. Um, the problem is that the way this negotiation goes in practice is usually uh, something along the lines of the news organizations coming up to Facebook and saying, you need to pay us to link to your news. And then Facebook going, here's my offer to you, nothing. And then the news organization's going, but you can't do that. And Facebook going, well, what are you going to do to stop me? Because you, you can't legally stop them from, you can't legally or technologically prevent somebody from linking to a thing. It is just a fundamental or part of the architecture of the internet. Um, and the news organizations basically go, uh, we can get mad about it. And then, the, the, and then it breaks down. Um, and so that's a lot of the concern around the sort of technical implications of this. But what ended up happening in Canada is that Facebook just decided, all right, we just won't carry news from Canadian sources. We don't want to. We don't want to pay. So you know, we were given an option, and our option is we just won't do it. Goodbye. Um, and now there's you know a summer of very extreme wildfires in Canada, and now the Canadian government is extremely upset because now there's no news on Facebook um, about these wildfires, and. There has been some metrics coming out that saying actually user engagement in Canada has not gone down for the lack of news. It's actually just held perfectly steady. So there is no there's no downside for something as big as Facebook to just say we're just not going to link to news on our platform. Um, can I say one thing about the JCPA that is sort of uniquely bad among um, different similar laws internationally? Like we see what happened in Canada. Um, the JCPA actually had like. People in Congress have observed what has happened in other countries, and so there are actually some provisions in there that, um, it, after some triggering events, would kind of force or attempt to force carrying and and for, uh, uh, have basically anti-retaliation provisions. So Facebook kind of couldn't drop content out, and in a way, you could see that as helpful for negotiation, um, but it raises all sorts of free speech issues. You know, uh, you think about if if you've got kind of fringe conspiracy theory news outlets that are included um, in these joint negotiations, all of a sudden now it's Facebook obligated to kind of carry and disseminate that content. Um, so unfortunately the lesson that Congress uh, took from what's happening around the world was not like, oh, this is a really bad idea. It's to kind of make it worse, I think. Okay, let's make it worse. We can do yeah. worse than that. Yeah. Hold my beer. Yeah. I think, I think there's a sense that to some degree the answer is that this is a very fancy way of not saying we're just going to tax the big tech platforms and we're going to give the money right. to journalist outlets, which is fundamentally what these are trying to do. And I, you know, you can ask me how I feel about that. I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, but because the idea of a tax is sort of politically toxic, you have these weird roundabout workarounds to avoid saying we're going to just take the money and redistribute it. And you end up with these schemas like... You know, well, you must pay to carry a thing which you're not legally obligated to carry. So we're going to make you legally obligated to carry it. And you can't say no. But also, if you do, there's all this other stuff that happens. Yeah, um, so I know we want to move on, but just the last point. There is actually something government could do here um, that it actually should do, um, which is intervene in the adjacent ad tech market. That's yeah. where it's happening, right? And that's where we have also virtual monopolies, and that is, and, and much of how it works is hidden from advertisers um, and regular people alike. And um, that there is a place where Congress could go and intervene, and or the FTC, other government agencies could exercise a f rarely exercised antitrust powers to actually break that market up and create real competition there, which would benefit readers, which would benefit advertisers, most advertisers, like people who are advertising <laughs> and are trying to sell their goods and services, and, um, and would benefit journalists as well because it would allow newspapers to sort of come a little bit back to life and really compete. It's not enough by itself because we've talked about sort of more fundamental problems with the, with the industry, but it would be a great big start 
and would actually, in large, large ways, attack one of the key sources of the problem as opposed to sort of trying to paper it over at this point. It had seemed to me, as I was looking through some of this, that in a, not a complete solution, but something rather better than, okay, first we're going to make some antitrust exemptions, and then we're going to make some other, and we're going to tack on to that is do something equivalent to a compulsory license. Say, if you're going to link, you pay a flat fee to whoever you're linking from. And, you know, you don't have to link, you don't have to do anything you want to, but just like, use it, just like you know, doing a cover version of a music composition that we can administer, maybe not the government, but in, um, can just have a compulsory license scheme that doesn't exist currently in this space, but might be a much less intrusive way if the goal is to move some money down to the bottom of the food chain in journalism. And I haven't well, heard much discussion. So I think the problem with that is that links aren't copyrightable. Well, does, I, I know it's not copyrightable, it's but well, there is if we say there is. They can make new legislation. If you link with the FCC, we can regulate whatever we want, and we so, can say this so is a if I new link, law. So if I link, I need to pay? A t who am I going to pay? How well, is it going to get collected? If you make a cover of a piece of music, you go through ASCAP, you go through someone, you pay a compulsory license. You can get a license if you're going to do it commercially. If we paralleled that structure here, it'd be less than breaking up um, large companies, and I think it would be a more straightforward mm. thing. But no, it wouldn't be copyright, because you're right, there's no copyright there, but that the government can tax and regulate or, what they want. Or the media just uses a paywall, so when you go to the link, because we see more and more paywalls anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, the question becomes that media outlet's business model. Because when we first started looking at e-commerce spaces and everything else, it was, we need to get the views up to get the numbers and the counts for the ad space. Well, the problem is that the value of the ad space has mm -hmm. gone down, and that's really the bigger problem. So now it's a question of, is anybody willing to pay for the news? Does anybody care? But having the paywall is a much less intrusive way even than the compulsory license, right. and then that much is better, and then you have, it's letting the market sort it out, unfortunately. That seems to be happening against anyway. the small visit, yeah. the small journalists, but you know, what can you intervene with without making everything worse? Um, so I will be the uh, political prognosticator on this, uh, as my role is the, the, one of the DC insiders. Um, I am part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so JCPA uh, keeps coming back, keeps dying, keeps coming back again. Um, it came, was introduced in the Senate again this Congress. It was just earlier this week reintroduced in the House, uh, an identical version to the Senate. Now, politically, without getting into too much detail, um, House leadership does not like this bill. They would rather not see it, have it see the light of day. The head of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, hates this bill. He will never give it a markup. Having said that... What the goal is, is to get it tacked onto a spending bill at the end of the year, to jam it into a must-pass, which we've seen, they call them Christmas tree bills, um, mm -hmm. where everyone finds their, their perfect thing, they take advantage of a fiscal funding crisis, and everybody hangs their little thing on it, and then it gets through, and that's how we get all these random laws that no one actually voted for. Um, so we're looking at potentially that happening again. So now that we've had that nice little downer note... Um, I do want to move on to the other bills in here. So, Courtney, can you talk a little bit about ShopSafe? Yes. Um, no, I am not going to tell you the acronym because I now have a new crusade, which is enough with the damn acronyms. If you torture the language to make it into, they started with the Can Spam Act. That's the first one I saw. It's like, oh, that was cute. Yeah, they need to stop now. Um, some of the TCPA stuff is even worse. but. This is not actually about, it's arguably about shopping, it's not about safety. The idea is that this bill will help with goods that impact safety. I don't know exactly what that means, but apparently shoes and handbags count. So <laughs> they talk as if we're dealing with legislation that's going to address um, car seats. And it also would address car seats. I get very skeptical anytime they start saying, won't someone think of the children before they've told me anything else? And that's the what is a good that is going to impact safety of the consumer, health and safety of the consumer. That means everything. So they're starting out, at least in my skeptical mind, being disingenuous and with a stupid acronym. So that's two strikes. Um, it's not so much a copyright bill as a trademark bill, but it's more of a shopping bill, as it's, that part at least is accurate. 
the, they're looking I, mainly at how or if contributory infringement can lie against a internet platform, against Etsy, against anywhere you're selling online. A lot of things are not well defined, as has been the habit of these pieces of legislation. And it's been edited a few times. Oh, now it's better. Yeah, now it's just a little different. Wait, which word did you change? I don't see how that changed that much. What they're trying to do is, well, actually, there's one thing I'm unclear on in what they're trying to do, but it's unclear even worse on what the effect is going to be. Contributory infringement is a thing. It already exists under trademark. If you are dealing with counterfeit goods, then you are violating the Lanham Act. You're violating a whole bunch of statutes. And if you're not the one selling it, but you're the one providing the platform where it's being sold, if you meet certain standards, the Tiffany case is the main one right now, um, which is basically knowledge and participation on some level, which can be supplying material support in the activity, you can be held contributorily um, part, part of the infringement. It's contributory infringement. It's a tort concept, so it's like contributory negligence. Same concept, it parallels in a lot of ways the same standard for contributory infringement and copyright. So they talk about the copyright cases some. But they're trying to say that if it's a good that involves safety, or you know all of them, then if, it's being so, if a counterfeit good is being sold online and you wait for this is who's going to be liable, it says and said, here's the safe harbor that if you follow these steps, you won't be held liable. So it is unclear to me if this will end up having the effect of here is an extra kind of cause of action for contributory infringement, or is this safe harbor going to erase what grounds would already exist to be in trouble for it? Because it's not, con it's not expressly part of the statute. So I'm not sure if this is supplementing or replacing or if they know which they're intending, which it will actually have the effect of doing down the way. If it's a matter of here are some good things you should do, it involves, you know, find out where, you know, there should be an address for the seller, there should be some contact information for the seller. If they're foreign, they should have some point of domestic contact. That's all fine. Then we get to some other squishy language about they should take reasonable, you have to ensure that if you're the platform, that the buy, that the seller of the of the counterfeit goods or not supposed to be counterfeit goods, is taking reasonable steps to make sure they're not counterfeit. That's a whole lot of squishy language that lawyers love because it means nothing or anything, and that's my biggest concern with the bill. Saying we should know where the sellers are located, there should be a point of contact for them. That's great, but. How much else do I have to do before I, as a platform, am actually safe? Am I safe from all contributory negligence? And then when you look at the details of what they're requiring for that safe harbor, again, some of it is, in my mind, poorly defined, you know, reasonable and sufficient steps. And the idea there is that there should be a balance between active enough steps that will make a difference, have fewer Honestly, what they're trying to affect is sellers in China selling counterfeit goods and then completely judgment proof because no one knows who they are or where they are. Okay, sounds like an issue. We're talking about safety, so you'll be concerned, except we're not talking about safety. We're talking about these Chinese sellers. Well, do we care about Amazon or do we care about very small platforms? Well, both. Well, then we need to balance between strenuous enough steps that could be things that Amazon could afford to use more um, technological solutions. They can have programmers building them better crawlers. Can a small platform? Well, no. So you need to balance between those two unless the point of the statute is to squish out the small ones or to make something worthless and say you did something. And so a legitimate issue, because we have all heard about the counterfeit goods on Amazon. Some of us have bought them, sometimes intentionally, um, sometimes a little Birkin bag for 20 bucks. I bet that's legitimate. Um, yeah, it may not have been. Gosh, go figure. But we have, there, are, there is an issue for American manufacturers who come up with a clever new product, and before they sell six of them on Amazon, there's a cheaper version from China, which undercuts their market because they can't compete, and it's whack-a-mole. Kill that one, there's another one that's probably the exact same people, but we can't tell. And that's ostensibly what this is addressing, but I'm not certain it would accomplish anything except add another line to compliance and one, two, litigators' checklists for suits. 
Does anyone want to add on to that? The only, yeah, the only other comment I'd make on that, because again, having worked in e-com and e-com spaces and worked for, forward with some of these sellers, um, is that idea that if we're going to allow merchants from out of the country to be selling product here, there's really no effective way to have liability, especially when it's coming from China. Um, and that to me would be a big problem because again, having worked with a lot of IP creators, a lot of product creators, things like this, you know, I mean, you can, you can do a lot, but fundamentally I, from my perspective, from a business perspective, from a tech perspective, as long, um, until there's a gateway company. So in other words, unless Amazon came in tomorrow and said, okay, yeah, you now have to ship product here and there's a new you know, new cost basis. Amazon is built based on fast and cheap. That's it. Mm -hmm. That encourages send crap. Yeah. And counterfeit goods and mm -hmm. destruction of, I did come up with a good product and people do want it, but they can't tell the difference between it and the other one because it looks just like mine and sometimes it's the same photograph. Um, and theirs is cheaper so everyone's buying it and then saying, wow, this product is crap. I don't want that. And it just, it not only undercuts but it then destroys the market because people who do buy it say this is garbage and no one often realizes which version they're buying they don't realize there's a quality one that the original um, developer came up with and then there's the crap knockoff because they look the same through Amazon and unless enough people just return their stuff to Amazon for Amazon to kill the seller there's no financial incentive and that only works so far when if that Chinese seller stops the next one comes up and they probably all are the same seller and they probably all by the same seller, I mean supported or directly yeah. from the government, and we can't whack a mole the government into compliance. Great. Uh, last bill we have on the docket, which is the Smart Copyright Act. Corinne, do you <laughs> want to talk about the Smart Copyright Act and how we feel about that acronym? Is it smart? Yeah, tell us the acronym. <laughs> I I hate this bill. Uh, it is. I do. I I am I am not in, um, harsh, impartial. Um, so I forget what SMART stands for. I just always think of it as like the most cynically named copyright bill that you can come up with because it is not SMART. It is bad. Um, so to understand this bill, though, you need to back up just a teeny bit. Um, so some of you maybe, if you're here, you hopefully are interested a little bit in copyright, which means that you might know that there's this thing called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, enacted 1998, basically struck a balance. Um, this very short version. There, so there's a lot of rights holders who are worried about online infringement. There's a lot of companies who are sort of emerging as platforms. This is pre-YouTube, pre-Google. This is early days, right? Um, and but know that if they are liable for any copyright infringing activity that happens via their platforms, via their services, they will go out of business immediately because in copyright there's a thing called statutory damages, which is sort of if you prove unlawful copying, automatically you get a certain amount of money out of the game. Um, so the balance, but on the other hand, the rights holders are like, there's a real problem and we just can't file a lawsuit against every individual act of infringement. You know, that'll put us out of business completely. So what do we do? So the um, DMCA strikes a bargain that says, okay, service providers, if you, here's are some safe harbors for you. If you comply with certain provisions, certain obligations, principle among them that as soon as you get a notice of copyright infringement and it follows certain requirements, you have to assert in good faith that the X material is infringing and identify it. You get one of those notices and it's legit, you will take down that material right away. And then there's some additional provisions that are supposed to prevent abuse and don't particularly well, um, which we can talk about later. But but that is sort of basically, but in exchange for the following those rules, you are not liable for the infringing activity of your users. Now, your own infringing activity, that's fair game, but not for the stuff of people that you host, who, things you posted. So, like, that's why we have YouTube. We would not have YouTube without this. We wouldn't have Facebook. We wouldn't have lots of things because we, most people don't like share their own material directly. They use these platforms to share it with, share it with the world or family or whatever. Okay, that was the bargain. Um, pretty much rights holders have never been very happy, or a lot of rights holders have never been happy, have never felt that this is actually a good enough bargain for them. DMCA notices are too much trouble, and there's too much infringement, and you could spend all your day tracking down infringing activity and sending notices, 
and that's more work than it's worth. So they have, for many years now, um, wanted to say, we think service providers should have more of an obligation here, should have more that they have to do to police infringement on their platforms. Um, service providers have responded to that in some cases voluntarily by establishing filtering mechanisms. So like content ID might be one that you're familiar with that's on YouTube. Um, different ways in which, so for example, the basic way it can happen is if you're a rights holder, you load a file and you say, if anything matches this file, it's infringing, take it down automatically. So I don't have to send a notice, it's just, or it will never go up at all. Okay. That's what filtering mechanisms do. Um, filters are also ripe for abuse and often wrong. They're not always wrong, but there's, there can be a lot of abuse. They mistakenly identify public domain material, for example. Um, they identify obvious fair uses as being infringing um, when they really shouldn't be. And you know, YouTube has spent well over $100 million trying to develop a good filter, and it's still full of problems, such that many people who are YouTube creators avoid using music in particular at all because it's so likely to have a situation where, they're, where they can't even load up their material at all. So filters are, you know, but, but on the other hand, they, you know, they can work partially. And so rights holders have come around to thinking, well, actually what we need is filters everywhere or something like that. Okay. Sorry for that long explanation, but it's the only way that the rest of it makes sense. So one of the things that was also supposed to happen in the DMCA was a provision that said, uh, service providers also have to comply with standard technical measures for policing infringement. What's a standard technical measure? It is something that has come to via consensus in a multi-stakeholder industry process, it's in the statute, I didn't make it up, um, between service providers and rights holders. Notably, users are not among the people who are supposed to be part of the conversation, but anyway, um, but there's supposed to be this consensus. This consensus has never happened. Nor um, will it ever. Nor will it ever. And part <laughs> of the reason, I mean, it's not just because people have different interests. It's also like we're talking about many different kinds of in um, industries here with different motivations. Because the thing is, the reality of the internet, there's copyrighted material everywhere in all kinds of industries on all, all different kinds of platforms that have really different motivations. Etsy is not YouTube, and, you know, et cetera. So um, this has been very frustrating for rights holders. So, the proposal in SMART, the SMART Act, is why don't we ask a government agency to figure it out for everybody else? Wait, wait, in let's fact, pick one with no knowledge. Yes, and in fact, why don't we ask the Library of Congress? Because they know copyright things, and um, this, that's their whole job to know copyright things. And, and then maybe they can hire a couple technologists, which we're like, oh, that's good, maybe two. But <laughs> that's probably not going to get you there. <laughs> Um, oh, come on, they might have three. They might have three. Um, but it basically, it's sort of like to kick it to the Library of Congress to convene a whole process and figure out, and whatever they decide is a standard technical measure, all the service providers have to comply with it. So that's bad for a bunch of reasons. One is because filters are kind of suck and take down lawful expression all the time. So that's a problem. But the other problem that I worry about is like, really, you do want serious technologists vetting this stuff. Because, you know, we've had situations in the past where um, um, DRM went and installed malware, malware into millions of computers. And no one caught that in advance. And that was a real problem. And so Sony, this is a Sony rootkit case for you know, the old, um, and my first EFF case. Um, <laughs> But it was a real problem for millions of people, and it was very embarrassing for Sony, and it helped kill DRM for music. But like that's the kind of thing that can happen all the time. And at copyright office listening sessions where we talked about standard technical measures, it was dominated, at least the session I was in, by people who were just trying to sell it. They were like, we have the best solution, please adopt us. And just like, just selling, sell it, always be selling, okay? Um, in, in a session that was supposed to be like a neutral conversation with multiple parties. So I think that I really worry about it, not just because I think we might end up in a place where we have just like bad filters that don't help anybody and just end up s snatching up a lot of lawful content, but also filters, you know, fly-by-night technology that isn't good for anybody. And the last thing it does, and then I'll get off my high horse and let others climb back up, um, is um, 
that it's really bad for competition. And I feel like a theme here is kind of competition. Because one of the things that can happen is like content ID is probably the best filter that we know of, and it still sucks. And, but it cost well over $100 million to develop and maintain. Well, you know, I personally would like a world in which I have alternatives to Facebook and alternatives to YouTube. I want a world in which there's lots of different platforms, and those aren't going to develop ever if um, the cost of doing business is that kind of buy-in. So it's, it's, it's such a bad idea for so many reasons. But, but you can see the motivation behind it, which I do understand very much. Rights holders are legitimately frustrated because they do see infringement of their works happening all the time, and they don't know what to do about it. So it's a problem, but this, this is not a solution. So that's my soapbox, <laughs> or my TED talk, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Kick that down to anyone else sure. who wants to follow up. Who disagrees? I'm usually the one who will stand up here and say, okay, I disagree with the rest of them. Um, I tend to have a different approach to a lot of the rights that we're talking about. And, you know, we can have an absolute grudge match over fair use, but uh, the Copyright Office? Seriously? Um, I don't think you could pick an, a part of the government that has less technical aptitude and say that they're supposed to do something that. <laughs> The, most, the you know the biggest of big tech hasn't accomplished. I think that we, if you look at it and say filters don't work well yet, well okay, tech turns on. I am confident that the market will create better solutions and better solutions. Now where we can get into a fist fight is where fair use, if at all, needs to be involved in that calculation. But at this point, you can look at the original DMCA and say. I'm not sure who you thought was going to sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya and all of the participants would agree. You couldn't get the five of us to agree and we are very similar in most ways in training. Um, and we would probably not agree. Now put people with actually opposing interests into the room and see if they'll agree voluntarily. It's not going to happen. So something else would be a better option, but not anything else, because sometimes don't do anything yet is the right answer. And I agree, there's definitely a problem here, and any rights holder will tell you that. You know, my stuff's all over, I can't find everyone who used my music in their, in their TikTok dance, but I really wish they weren't using it. And I want to enforce my rights, and there's nine million of them, I can't. Is it a problem? Sure. Is this the solution? I know, since the Library of Congress has no technical aptitude whatsoever, let's require them to do something that people who do have it haven't accomplished yet. That boggles my mind. They recently required, here's my tech level of the Library of Congress example. Recently they changed the rules about filing a copyright assignment. If you're, uh, if you're assigning your rights and your copyright to someone else, you file it with the office, people know it's been done, yay. They have had very annoying detailed rules about having a live signature on the, on the piece of paper that you file with the copyright office. It can't be a copy, it can't be the blah, blah, blah. There are lots of detailed regs and you always try very hard to follow them because you feel like an idiot if you have to go back to the client and say, hey, remember that merger you did? Um, I need you all to sign something else again because I got it right. Yeah, you don't want to be there. Well, now they say we want you to give us digital copies but it needs to be a still an original signature. I have to upload it, but it has to comply with the regs about actual ink on the page. Is that there's no page. And when I upload it, I'm uploading the copy. There are a lot of people you have to go through at the Library of Congress with that concern before you find one who understands it. There was one, He's one of the directors, and eventually he took my call um, and said, oh, yeah, we're going to have some new regs on that. <laughs> were you going to share them? <laughs> so, um, were you going to So that is the level of technological advancement in the Library of Congress Copyright Office. But I'm sure they can come up with a program that works better than anything that YouTube and um, the other bigs have come up with. So I will so, note here, uh, politically, so actually political uh, prognostication on this, um, this has not been reintroduced, this Congress, um, knock on what it stays that way. Um, a large part of that is because the Copyright Office, when asked 
by which we mean voluntold that they will be doing uh, this particular rulemaking, just kind of did this gesture. <laughs> and they like, know they can't so do They it. really yeah. don't want to. They super duper don't want to do it. Um, so. so I'm going to cut in because I'm going to touch on three sides of this because, again, I can't do something e the easy way. Um, being the writer, right? Being a writer, being a, being a creator, and, and producing the amount of work I do, I would like to see my work protected. And with some of the other changes they're presenting in copyright law, I have concerns about how long the copyrights are going to last, a lot of things that are coming and happening. And, you know, even when I do things that, are, that I do intentionally because it's educational material, things that we produce under Creative Commons licenses, things that we're putting out there, I'm less concerned about when it gets shared, but at least give accreditation so we can pull stuff back. But this is, I mean, piracy is a huge problem with the DMCA and the DMCA Act and takedown notices and, and playing that whack-a-mole. The services that are coming out that will do some of that for you, eh, they're okay for the cost. But if it's worth saving the time and if you're getting hit enough, like I got pulled into the ebook.bike case out of Canada and, and some of that stuff. The second piece I'm looking at, because I run a virtual network where we do a ton of panels in the creative space. We've done about a thousand shows in three and a half years. We put out a fair amount of content. We work with a lot of people that work in a lot of IP spaces. We do a lot of stuff with people working in Star Wars and Marvel spaces and different places like this, which means we are working with often those producers of that content. Well, this becomes a problem sometimes when we drop a show on Facebook or YouTube or some of these platforms, they go and say, we think you might have something that's copyrighted and protected by somebody here. Nobody's objected yet, but somebody might. And so we have to go jump through hoops to go and say, there's nothing here that is not our produced content and the IP creators are the people that are on talking about it and doing promotion in conjunction with the IP holder and the producer. So there's times we have to jump through this. So if we look at these ideas from a technological standpoint, I mean, for example, one of the backup data hosting companies that I use to, ho to hold all of our offline backups for prior shows and stuff like this gives me hell every time a file name looks like it might have something or it mentions Marvel, DC, Disney, you know, insert your company here. They're like, we think that this could happen. Like, <laughs> So then I'm going to jump now to the third part, which is I'm a technologist. I work in this space. I, you know, a lot of the things that we I've been involved in over the years in terms of implementing systems. Um, the cost of this is prohibitive with a question of where's the return. So this becomes another point of consolidation of technology, consolidation of companies, consolidation of IP, because fundamentally the next big problem becomes what can I or can I not show or run on these platforms because at the end of the day either it becomes if you're talking about XIP you have to have something registered from that IP holder that says yes you can do this which gets into the whole idea of fair use and those problems would destroy YouTube so YouTube's not going to back that Facebook is publicly coming and said we want people to talk to each other again Liars. They want memes, cat videos, and click on our ads. <laughs> um, so when I look at it from all three of these places, and having done work with government, I can assure you they do not understand technology. If the IRS, the cash printing machine that is the IRS, can't get a tax system built, I haven't looked to see what the latest number is, but it, I don't think it's hit a T yet in the number but they can't figure out taxes on how to build taxes. Do you really think the copyright office, which has a couple of guys sitting in the back drinking coffee and underpaid, are going to come up with a, a just even a set of provisions and guidelines for the technology to do this? I will tell you right now, I think the chances are better of me winning the lottery tonight with a ticket I don't have. Right. Well, we got about 10 minutes, so I wanted to leave it open to audience questions. So if folks got a question, feel free to get a line up at the mic, because we do not have the little cube mic this year. I miss the cube. I know. The cube I was great. The cube. Please go ahead. Yeah, go right go ahead. We're going to complain about not having a cube, but you could ask a question instead. Otherwise, we'll fill 10 minutes of 
grouching without the cube. Sure. Um, so I think one of the, so with the SMART Act, you've mentioned a lot of the government agencies that shouldn't do it. If, if there is, what government agency would you trust to do it? To enforce that, if any? The NSA. So, oh, wait. Sorry. <laughs> so, so just to be clear, the, the, the proposal isn't that they, the Copyright Office, build it itself. I mean, that would be, <laughs> but, but, but rather that they, but, but that the Copyright Office sort of invite people to present it. You could like you know, send in your proposal and then they'll vet it. But that's, that's not much better, right? Because you still need expertise to be able to, to vet these different kinds of measures um, and then figure out all the varying effects on competition and multi-industries and so on if you adopt them. So it comes back to the same problem of needing expertise, but it's, it's even beyond tech expertise. You need expertise in markets and competition and so on. Um, so I'll be honest with you, I cannot conceive of any government agency that is actually capable of doing this thing, and I think that that's, that's okay. You know, there are things that government is good at. Like, I, I feel like are we there? just told you all these I've terrible, like about all this bad legislation, and like, you know, it's there are some good, there's some good, like, legislation around competition that's being proposed right now. Like, there's some decent proposals. These just aren't them. In the IP space, you know, the government really hasn't been doing, or the um, Congress has not been doing a particularly good job lately, and the government agencies haven't been doing a particularly good job either. They just really haven't shown their ability to do it. And I think that part of the key, the problem, or part of why, isn't just that I do think that there's a lot of smart people in government. I know smart people in government, but they're still ramping up their tech expertise and they're always behind. Um, and then the other problem is that the decisions that they make around copyright, copyright is expression. So every time you're making a regulation in this space, you're making a decision about what kinds of expression you're going to encourage and discourage. And that is something that we should really, I think in this country, we have a long tradition of mostly thinking that government should stay out of that job and should really have it in, in a pretty limited way. So it doesn't really trouble me that much. I don't think we're gonna tech our way out of this problem, is what it, the reality. So Corinne activated my trap card, um, which means I have to do my spiel here, uh, which is basically that if you read the history of copyright in the 20th century, which, I'm sure many of you have done that as just a fun bit of Saturday research. Um, if you're interested, Jessica Littman has a book called uh, Digital Copyright, which tracks exactly this. It's how copyright law has changed since the beginning of the 20th century. Historically, up until very, very recently, as in within the span of my career, um, copyright has been seen as a business-to-business -business series of laws. It has been structured around industry A interacting with industry B, um, in terms of the sort of superstructures of law that we have built up around it. Um, and the history of copyright law in the 20th century has been uh, a bunch of incumbents exist, some new business format or media format or something uh, breaks down the door, eats everybody's lunch and flips the table over. Uh, the incumbents get really mad. They take two and a half decades to negotiate a new copyright act, which trades a bunch of horses. And then as soon as the ink is dry on that, some other new incumbent comes in, kicks in the door, upsets the table and eats everyone's lunch. And then the cycle just repeats ad infinitum. Um, Having said that, uh, you may notice that um, actual end users slash consumers were never part of this equation. Uh, and nowadays, you simply cannot get on the internet or live your life without bumping up against copyrighted content, as Corinne rightly pointed out. It is everywhere where you're interacting with it all the time, which means that we we're as... It. And we're making yeah. it. And as individuals individual schmucks we are just bumping up against like, these you know century old laws that were not written with us in mind uh and running afoul of them very frequently um for things that you know frankly i think most people agree do no harm in most cases if i am sharing the socially awkward penguin meme am i got violating copyright i don't know uh getty images sure seem to think so because they went on a lawsuit spree against people who use that image um but it's you're sharing a meme uh, try me um, so the point of this is that end users have only just, and I, I mean just within the last decade, started being a factor in how these problems even get considered at the congressional level. Um, we are seeing this change in real time, so I am hopeful that it continues to get there, but sometimes dragging policymakers there requires a lot of kicking and screaming to get them there. So, next question. Yeah.
but the gerontocracy seems to want it to happen, so it happens. How does this car crash play out? Who wins? So, uh, the good news, and then, well, I'll let others speak. The good news is actually, I think this one we're going to be able to kill. Um, but it might take a while. It's going to be one of those that we have to keep coming back, and we're going to have to keep killing it, and we'll come back, and we have to keep killing it. Um, and the reason, though, I feel good about our ability to keep killing it is because, there, at least in the United States, there's so many clear arguments against it, and because a lot of, there's a lot of different kinds of people who don't necessarily trust the Copyright Office, like don't trust this strategy. The more likely thing that I think end users should be worried about is that we get something like they have in Europe. Mm -hmm. which is now there are effectively filtering mandates on um, large uh, platforms. Confusingly, these filtering mandates must, the, the companies implementing them must also though not interfere with lawful expression. And there's n recent court decisions about this. And the platforms are like, I don't know how to comply with the law, um, and so we'll see how that plays out. But I do think that we could see um, some mandate like that if, because people do, you know, we look to other countries and we think like, well, I don't know, that, that doesn't, the internet didn't break, so maybe it's okay, maybe we'll do that too. Um, so, and it, it will feel simpler and cleaner. Um, but anyway, I think we're, we're far away from that point, but that is a thing I could see, um, something a little simpler like that happen. Simpler, but probably worse um, happening. So this is going to be a fully formed question. Um, with regards to the journalism bill, uh, we're generally agreeing that it's not a great idea, but we do need to fund journalism somehow. Mm -hmm. Government, a, a government tax on some companies to fund journalism is probably a good way to go about it, maybe. The concern there is how do you decide which journalism outfits receive the tax money? What sort of safeguards would you want to see put in place with this? I think that there's an extra layer of problem there also because if the government, okay, first off, no, I don't think a new tax is ever a good no. idea. But um, beyond that, if the government starts funding the journalists, we now have officially created a state-run media. And if, because if the government's paying you, the government's controlling <laughs> stuff. I mean, it, some of y'all remember when the drinking age went up to 21 because the government said, if you're, yeah, okay, we can't mandate that, but we're not going to give you any money, each of you states, unless you raise your drinking age. Well, did they really have any say over that? Well, we let you build us some roads. Well, now we can control what you do on them. If, we're go if the government on any level is going to fund the journalists, they're not journalists anymore. Structured payroll tax cuts. Um, I, so we are at time. Uh, <laughs> that is the lamest last word of all time. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do actually encourage folks who are interested in this to read a colleague of mine, Lisa McPherson, wrote um, a plan. Uh, it's called the Super Fund for Local Journalism Model, which is basically a funding pool idea to try to tackle this, uh, also deal with the misinformation crisis. Um, but anyway, uh, we are at time. So folks who still have questions, feel free to come up and ask us afterwards. Um, but thank you for coming out. Please be sure. To, yes. I'm sorry, also thank you for coming out, but I just want to say um, EFF also has a series that was written by special counsel Cory Doctorow, who you might know because he's a writer in this space. Um, and it's um, at, you can find it at EFF.org, and it really sort of walks through several specific steps that people and governments can take if we really want to save journalism, um, and all of it is not the JCPA. <laughs> Please be sure to rate our panel. Thank you.